Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 179 of Real Blend, a podcast that is best consumed as a phone recording of a laptop ripped from TikTok and re-uploaded to YouTube. My name is Sean (laughs) O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend with a different backdrop, and I'll explain why in a minute. On this week's show, two new Marvel trailers are dropped that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Candyman hits theaters. And a few of us have seen it. And David Lowry, the director of The Green Knight, is our guest. And by our, I mean Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hi, Kev. Sean, Jacob, (laughs) Gabriel. Gabriel. We love you guys. (laughs) And Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hi, Jakey. Sean, where are you? Well, let's get into that right now. Uh, I'm in Las Vegas, and I was going to miss the show. And Gabe Kovach, uh, our silent producer relatively silent producer was going to fill in we've been taxing gabe a lot lately uh filling in chairs and so uh i made it back i'm here for CinemaCon, and we're going to talk about some of the cool things i've been able to see so far and some things i'm looking forward to seeing but it's a weird <sighs> kevin you got to come to this one year because i'd love to the driving narrative of every single panel is movie theater experience movie theater experience uh tom rothman came out uh, to do the Sony panel last night, and he was like, "Hey, I went and saw Free Guy, and I, th- this was his language essentially. Hey, it's doing really well. Why do you guys think it's doing well? Because it's fucking in movie theaters, <laughs> and you yeah. can't see it at home. And of course, he's playing to the crowd, and everybody rips into applause. And uh, but everything is just so. I'm kind of excited. Did anyone for raise their hand and say the highest grossing film of the year came out streaming and movie theaters at the same what? time? What is it? What's the highest grossing? Isn't it film Black Widow? Well, oh. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. Black Widow's a different circumstance because it had that $30 fee to it, but sure. That helps. Yeah, yeah. Um, tonight is Warner Brothers. And, I, oh. and today at the MGM panel, uh, well, right before it, some guy from NATO, which is the organization behind movie theaters, made an adamant statement of saying day and date releases do not work. And everybody Good. just ripped into applause in the in the auditorium. But I, I think Warner Brothers is going to get booed. I mean, I, I well, will not be surprised if they get booed when they come out. It's an interesting thing, but I've said this a million times in the show, and I still believe it. Before the pandemic started, there was a 90-day window. So it, the window already always existed. So just put yeah. these films out in theaters first, force the theatrical, and then bring them to streaming platforms in a, in a shorter theatrical window. It, 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 honestly, that's what HBO Max should be doing, and they're doing it next year, right? It's a 45-day window next yes, year. But correct. you're 100% right, though. Let us know the tone of that room, because... Yeah. WB but, is really is WB the only studio that does day and date for f- basically for free with the subscription? Yes. yes. Okay, 100%. but 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 100%. but let's let's go pull all the people in that crowd that were yeah. applauding and like, yeah, day and date. And I want to put a lie detector test on their arm and say, did you press play on any of the HBO Max titles on opening weekend? Like Dude. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but, uh, it, yeah. but it's okay. Yeah, oh, the the lifeblood of them is the theater, and I understand where they're sure. coming from. All right, all right let's yeah, get to this yeah. in a little bit. We'll talk about CinemaCon down the road. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, first off, hello. Thank you for joining us here for the visual components uh, of the Real Blend podcast. Uh, you can head over, if you're listening to us on audio, and you want to join the the YouTube uh, stream of it, go to youtube.com backslash Real Blend Podcast. And while you're there, hit subscribe and turn on your notifications. Of course, we're available every place that you get podcasts. Uh, your podcast needs met. You can download us and subscribe to us. That helps you uh, learn about all the content that we're putting out every single week. We have a ton of interviews that are hitting this week. We have some really big ones that hit last week, too, that you're going to want to catch up on. Um, and again, Lowry is part of this week's show. Uh, Real Blend Premium, if you want to sign up for that, you can get an ad-free version of the show, a newsletter from me every other week, including one coming out this week, um, and then uh, a new show that we do every single Monday. So if you want to join up for that, it's cinemablend.com backslash Real Blend Premium. We are also having a watch party. Uh, all of us are going to be watching Indiana Jones. No, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the very first Indiana Jones film. Next week. On Monday, August 30th. Correct. At 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be using the hashtag CinemaBlend Movie Club because we're going to be joined by some other CinemaBlend editors and all the Real Blend guys are going to be watching Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think we're also going to be doing uh, Temple of Doom and Last Crusade as a CinemaBlend site. Uh, Jake has made it very adamant he will not be joining us for that. And yes. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I think we're doing all four. Oh, Jesus, no, really? Oh, wait, oh. are we really? The site, the site, the site. The you guys site don't have to. is going oh. to. Yeah, you guys you are only connected to, to the first one. 
But yeah, can, can I skip whatever. Crystal Skull? I'll do the other <laughs> yeah. three. I you like skip yeah. Crystal Skull. You you do you. If you look, my Twitter timeline for Crystal Skull will be no, nope, stop, <laughs> please don't do this. Why? Um, you have the 4K. Do you have the 4K that came out, dude? The 4K you know who doesn't transfer. Have it? Me, I don't have it. So the 4K transfer of the Indiana Jones, I call it trilogy. I'm not going to refer to the fourth one. Um, is incredible i mean they they, these transfers that they're doing they're going back to from what i understand for a lot of the transfers outside of indiana jones going back to original 35 millimeter camera negatives and 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 pulling that and that's how the transfer is playing i watched true romance the other day on 4k was when they went back to the original 35 negative that uh that with that that uh tony scott shot one of the Mm -hmm. most beautiful transfers i've ever seen the indiana jones transfer is outstanding so is the back to the future one uh by the way i had a question and this is sorry if this is stupid um when raiders of the lost ark came out it was just called raiders of the lost ark right it was it was was never indiana Indiana jones Jones became on the temple of doom so my i guess my question is is raiders of the lost ark technically now called indiana jones and the raiders of the lost ark at one point they went back and tried to rebrand it yes okay but it never really caught on like Star Wars was always just Star Wars the yeah, first right. when it and came it out and then it became episode four. Okay. Correct. Yeah. The so only reason I asked about so the weird. 4K transfers because I understand that they did a color grade tr- uh, change on Crystal Skull because Crystal Skull had a really bad digital sheen to it. That's the one I haven't put in yet. <laughs> I haven't put I, that one I, in yet. I think you should take a look at it because some people said they tried to color grade it to make it look a little bit closer to the original trilogy. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. All yes. right. Now. I'm interested in that. I am always hesitant about post edits to movies that are like done. Mm-hmm. Like, like I, I always found it so strange that Lucas went back in and fixed. I kind of you know, love those that. films. I kind of love that. Kind of love you really? that. Why? I, I love I, it. I feel like it's a timestamp. You shouldn't mess with what was well, done no, and put out. Well, no. I think that. Well, let me. I guess I should clarify. I kind of love that, but I think that the original should be just as readily available as the new version. Sure. I love yeah. the idea of us going. Oh my gosh! What did that artist? How did their, this version of this change in 30 years to them? Or what did what can they do now that they couldn't do then that they mm-hmm. want to do? I find that as a really interesting experiment. Yeah, Lucas ruined a lot of those Star Wars scenes. Mm-hmm. According to you. According but, to you. yeah, you can't say he wrote it if it's his. It is. It's his. That's what I'm saying. That's See, what I- I don't, I don't I'm not I'm not a fan of the make good I'm okay with like like a director's cut or a different edit or like this is this is Lucas's uh, version of the new film but like the problem with the Star Wars re-releases and correct me if I'm wrong uh-huh. there was a time period where you couldn't get the original films yeah that's what anywhere. I'm I agree with yes. you that's what I'm saying that's, I think that should problematic. be problematic yeah. sure well, no, and I agree that those should be readily available but I don't dis I don't dismiss how interesting it is that that an artist can come back and and reapproach the same piece of work mm-hmm. in a new way. I, I think that's I think that's I fascinating. And they always I, say, I mean, yeah. filmmakers always say that they never finish a movie. They just there's a deadline and they just stop working on it. Mm-hmm. But with, yeah. with Jake, Lucas, Jake, you had something. Well, I was just gonna say with Lucas, it was interesting because his big line about why he took that gap between the first three and then the prequels was that he was waiting on technology to to catch up mm-hmm. uh, because of the ideas he had. I sort of wish. He had waited on technology to progress a little further before he went in and tinkered with uh, the original yes. trilogy because some of the ideas that he had could be done today in theory. Like if he wanted to, like the the whole like Han Solo and Jabba thing, where like Han like weirdly like floats over Jabba's tail, you know, if it, like didn't all he? that would be done much better mm. today. Then it, then it. I wish he'd waited. If his line was, "I need to wait for technology," like I wish didn't, he'd waited for technology. Then didn't the Disney Plus versions have some sort of things changed about them? Wasn't there they something? Did. They did. Well, they added like a, a, a line, like uh, Greedo says a line before he shot. Yeah. Like he says, McCl- what is it, McCluskey That's or something? Like, it's still like weird. Like what? That? Yeah. That? We needed that. So I, I will say this, um, and this is going to go against my previous statement, just because kind of Gabe's Gabe's point that he just made is interesting, and, and I'll tell you why this worked for me. So because of uh, televisions and 4K TVs and, and the at-home experience becoming uh, even better in terms of quality, one of the shots in Terminator 2 that always bothered me as I watched it years later on better televisions was the shot when Arnold drives off that part uh, in the yeah. scene when he's chasing the T-1000 yeah. and the 18-wheeler. Mm-hmm. And, he, he, and you can he see jumps. it's the stuntman? You can see it's the stuntman's <laughs> face. Yeah. So in the 4K transfer they just put out, they fixed it and put oh. uh, and put art, but it looks really good. So really, in, what's funny is 
that one. Can they do that, they do that to the bitch. baby in American Sniper? You think? I mean, they should. <laughs> but what, what, that's funny. Well, I was watching a, 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 an, an old film the other day. I think it was Rashomon or something like that. And they had a baby in there. I'm like, they had a live baby in there. Why couldn't Eastwood get a live baby oh, in, dude. In, in American Have Sniper? Have you guys seen Annette? <laughs> Wait, let me bring one up. Well, hold on. Not before Annette. Um, there's a Breaking Bad episode that we just watched where Marie questions Skylar and how much Skylar knew before she, uh, like, when Hank was there. So then Marie tries to take their baby, and she and Skylar have a fight in the living room, and it's so clearly a plastic baby that Marie is <laughs> holding as she wrestles back and forth. It's almost as bad as the American Sniper. It really caught me. What happens the in the net? The tea... The T2 one I don't mind, by the way, because it's just it, it was just making the shot look better. It wasn't changing anything narratively. I don't know. It's a yeah. hard. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fine line. I, I see where Gabe's coming from, but I also feel like when you make a narrative change, like Greedo shooting first or something like that, that's that that changes the whole scene. It changes the character. The right? cops in so, ET having flashlights instead of guns. Ah, oh, t- but it's his choice. What happens in the net? Before we move on, I know we got to move on, but what happens in the net? Oh, it's the the baby for the most part of the film Annette the baby is yeah. Annette it's uh it's a puppet it's meant to be a puppet oh, that's um, so weird but it's it's a I'm that, afraid oh, to press play on that movie I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts yeah I gotta I, give it I, a shot. And by the way I was mentioning a scene with a baby I think it was Rashomon but I can't remember I was watching an older film and I saw and they had a baby in it I'm like and I thought to myself why couldn't Eastwood just get a real baby was it um <laughs> look who's talking because look who's talking yeah, yeah, yeah. that was us too yeah. T-O-O. Uh, yeah, T-O-O. All right, weekly poll. I'm going to ask Jake this question because he hasn't seen Shang-Chi yet. Uh, so, Jake, I put out a weekly poll to the Real Blend listeners, and I asked, which one are you most excited for? And I chose sure. Shang-Chi and Eternals, the two Marvel movies that are coming next that aren't named Spider-Man No Way Home, which we're going to talk at length about. So, um, first off, tell me what you choose, and then tell me what you think the audience chose. I think I and the audience chose Eternals. No, you are correct. Fifty-four percent. Now, why for you? Oh, it's close. Uh, I I like that we're moving more uh, to sort of a galactic part of uh, the MCU. I like that, you know, I feel like we were so you know grounded in in you know on Earth for for quite a time, and you know those little flashes, those moments of Guardians and Thor Ragnarok really started teasing, um, and even Captain Marvel to a degree kind of started teasing that we're starting to look up. Um, mm-hmm. within the MCU, and, and that excites me. And I like this idea of Eternals um, proving that this is not just a new thing. Mm-hmm. Like, these are not just heroes that, that came around with, with when Tony Stark turned into Iron Man, that to a certain degree they've been around for, for millennia. Yeah. Um, and, and I also like the idea of not just that, but having to answer the question, where have you been? Like, mm-hmm. how can you watch what's happened and just stay watching? Um, so I just feel like it's asking a lot of questions and, and expanding um, the possibilities of what the MCU can be. So, so not saying that Shang-Chi doesn't do that or even needs to do that. Shang-Chi can be a, an incredibly great film by just being a great film. It doesn't need to be bigger or more connected than any other Marvel film. But I like the idea of sort of this more epicness of, of Eternals. All right, we're going to get to Eternals in a second uh, when we get to talking points. But first off, we have a really exciting interview for this week's episode. Uh, yeah. David Lowry was going to be on the show back when Green Knight was coming out in theaters. Uh, our schedules just didn't align. And then I love the fact that he came back around and said he wanted to, to talk to us um, about his, his movie, which we're all uh, big fans of. So I want to uh, toss it to that, and then we're going to come out of that, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Green Knight, and we're going to get into the Eternals and the Spider-Man and stuff I've seen at CinemaCon. But first, uh, David Lowry on the Rebel End Podcast talking about the Green Knight. Hi, David. Hey, how David. are you? How are you doing? How are you guys? Good. 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 Thank you so much for Honored taking the time. Honored to have you. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Um, David, do you mind just giving yourself a little more headroom, just a little more head, just because it's cutting off the frame? Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, there we go. You're directing yeah, the director, Kevin. I, was saying, I love Honestly, it, Kevin. What are you doing? David Lowry. What are you I'm doing? Sorry. Uh, I'm terrible at Zoom, so you guys are, I'm using my wife's office because the last room I was in just failed miserably, so hopefully <laughs> oh. it all works out. Uh, I will throw this as uh, to the interview as part of the show. I just want to let you know that this is my favorite movie of the year, and I'm, I'm so oh, excited to be able to talk to you about it. So um, I want to start with the sound design that you used to convey the presence of the of the Green Knight. Uh, it was so fantastic uh, and really helped immerse me in the scene. Can you talk about some of the elements that you uh, wanted to make sure were part of that sound design? And also, I read somewhere that I think you immediately vetoed the idea of doing the Green Knight in CG. Is that right? Yeah, that was that was never going to be that was never on the table. 
I did have a brief moment where I thought about doing him as a puppet, like a full size, like dark crystal <laughs> style puppet. Oh, wow. But, um, that would have just been beyond our means. So <laughs> we set that one aside too and uh, decided to just cast a really, really good actor. Um, for the sound design, you know, I have to give credit to Ralph Ineson, who does a lot of work just with his own voice. He is just, you know, he brings so much to that. But on top of that, um, we, you know, when you're weeding a garden and you pull out those roots of a weed by the, you know, it makes that sound. That's like a little like earthy pop. And I wanted every movement of his to have that sort of earthiness to it. And so that was my note to Johnny, our sound designer was like, can you make him sound like when you're just like pulling things out by the roots, every move he makes should feel like he's uprooting himself. And so that was, oh, that was wow. the basis of it. I, I, I don't doubt that Johnny went into his garden and started, you know, recording himself <laughs> pulling weeds out. But, uh, that was, that was, my, that was, the, that was the mission statement for, for the green Knight was to just sound like he's constantly just being uprooted. That's awesome. Wow. Funny enough, I, 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 I we, we work on local TV uh, in, in, in the DC area, and I did a segment the other day where I was I went to a garden and I was pulling carrots out, and that sound is incredibly interesting. It's a really <laughs> funny thing that you mentioned in terms of that. So, um, I, I, I'm sorry, say it again. It's a very satisfying sound. I agree with you. I, 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 I kept pulling carrots. I'm like, this feels really nice. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, in terms of, I want to talk about your camera and your lenses because I'm reading a great book right now, Making Movies by Sidney Lumet, and he's talking all about these incredible ideas of like the lenses that he used in his film, whether they, they be wider, wide angle lenses or long lenses to create a narrative theme or, or claustrophobia or a certain element of that. And I know you shot on the Ari Alexa 65 with the Ari Prime DNA lenses and I think it's interesting. And I wanted to ask you in terms of the camera you chose and the lenses you chose, what you wanted, to, what those meant to you in terms of narrative, because visually your film is stunning. But I, I was wondering, maybe you can even walk through a scene, maybe the Christmas scene, whatever scene you want to walk through in terms of the lenses you chose and the camera you chose, obviously, and kind of what that meant, that meant to you from a narrative uh, place as a filmmaker. Definitely. I mean, from the various I'm various. What kind of word is that? Very earliest <laughs> conversations I've had with Andrew. I, I described this idea I had that the film should look like it's in 3D without being in 3D. Oh, cool. and that was oh, that cool. was sort of my idea. Was that it should feel like the the width and breadth of the image is not related entirely to the aspect ratio, but to how much you see within that frame, and even in a close up that you see a lot. So the great thing about the uh, Alexa 65 is that that field of vision is just huge. Like, and, and one of the weird things about working with is you just have to get used to like the new math and the math you have to apply when you're putting lenses on. Cause every, you know, um, diameter means something different. You know, a 40 mil on a, a Aerie 65 does not mean the same thing as a 40 mil on a, you know, regular Alexa. And so we, all, I think the 40 was usually the longest we'd ever use. And that sort of was our hero lens. It's funny because I just finished shooting a new movie also on the Aerie 65. And I, you know, every movie you kind of like find the lenses within the first week, you find the, the ones that you're going to rely upon. And I couldn't remember which ones we had used the most on, um, on the green night, because I gotten so like in the weeds with my new movie. And so I emailed Andrew and was like, which, what were our, what were our go-to lenses? And it was the 28, the 40. And then we had, um, the 28 and the 40 were usually the ones we'd, we'd vacillate between. And then we had our 58 T which, um, was a specialty lens from Ari, which uh, turns out in the new movie, we used the 28, the 36 and the 58T as well. So that we, I, <laughs> I, I kind of like those now, that, that's sort of like the, the limits of like what I like to, to do. Um, but we really, we were like, let's never go long. Let's never use long lenses. We did sometimes, but we wanted to sort of create this sense of the environment being a part of the, the shots and even in a close up. So we rarely would go to something that was like longer than the 40. I'm trying to think of some of the, the key long lens shots and they really are like towards the end of the movie, for example, like when um, Gawain's in the Green Chapel and we're like right up on his face. I feel like that was something like a 65 probably. Um, but, uh, but you know, when a 65 is like your telephoto lens, it's still, you're, you're not going very long. And, yeah. and then we used like, we, what we found out was that we used that 58T for the entire ending sequence. So anything that had needed to have like that degree of like projection to it, where you're seeing this sense of, you know, the future unfolding and we wanted to convey that it was slightly outside of reality, we'd use that 58T um, and that was a little longer. And so sometimes we would have to use a wider lens just to get the image, like when the, when the, um, 
when the princess comes and Gawain's having his wedding, I mean, we needed a slightly wider lens to see that courtroom. And so we would just, Andrew would go in and paint Vaseline onto the lens to try to suggest, you know, the same sort of affectations that the 58T would have. Not as perfect, but it, it blends in just, uh, just as well. And, cool. uh, but that doesn't answer your question about narrative so much. I mean, we really, we really, in our lens choice selection, like for the opening sequence in that great hall, we, we tried to make sure that we were always seeing as much as we could of that, of that environment. And, and that was really what it was. And on a, on a, a narrative level, if I ever went longer than that 40, it was because I needed to isolate a character. I needed to like mm. bring them into a world in which the environment didn't matter as much. And it was just all about them. And that was again, more confined to the, the latter parts of the movie with the green Knight. It's fascinating. So fascinating. I think the first, the first time we use that is when the green Knight cuts his head off or when Gawain cuts the Green Knight's head off and he holds it up uh, to Gawain. And that was probably like a 60 or a 65. And that's the first time, that's the first time we used like a longer lens in the movie and mm. it pops because the world falls away and it's just those two faces uh, opposing yeah. each other. Good. That's awesome. Thank you for geeking out about that. I, I was always, I'm always fascinated by that stuff. So thank you. Oh, I love, I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude, you can talk about it all day, man. It's always oh, so cool. David, I want to talk about the the two different cuts of the film. The one that was ready to go before the pandemic that the yeah. rumor is it was a little bit more action packed. And then the one that uh, you were able to sort of work on it after some time. And that's the version that we got. I'm sort of curious as to maybe which scenes were most affected by you having some extra time by this new cut and uh, sort of what brought you to even give it another pass to begin with. Well, let me, you know, Correct the record. It was not more action packed. No, it was okay. That's <laughs> interesting. Because that's what I'd heard. Action. Yeah, the movie was never never had that much action in it. But what it was was faster. I would say it was probably ten minutes faster. Um, hmm. And it was all the same scenes. And in fact, like the ending of the movie never changed. Like the from the time he leaves the Lord and Lady's castle to the final cut to black, that has pretty much been the same since the first assembly. None of that ever changed. The scene at the beginning with the Green Knight went through a million iterations, you know, the, the whole Christmas dinner at Camelot, but that wasn't like changing. It was just fine tuning. The thing that changed the most, I think, was between the Green Knight's departure from Camelot, where we cut, you know, you know the, the year passes, the, the title is a too quick year. That was real two of the film. And wow. that real changed the most. And it, again, it wasn't that the contents of it were vastly different you know a couple scenes like little fragments of scenes came and went and 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 you know that maybe i think we i think i cut out one scene from the um from the movie that would have opened in last may but really it was the pace i had gotten really hung up on having a shorter faster movie and I don't know why exactly, other than that I was just like self-conscious about the film and, and didn't, you know, I was like worried the audiences would get bored and let's just embrace the word boring. The movie is what it is and no amount of truncation is gonna change the feel of it. It's not like I'm adding more action and I was just making things happen more quickly. And in doing that, I think I was depriving myself and audiences and the movie itself of the experience of, of everything the movie actually had to offer. So like, for example, in that reel too, um, where the year passes, there's a brief sequence where you see Gawain having his portrait painted. In the cut that would have come out, like, you know, last May, that would have been two seconds. And now I think it's about 30 seconds or a minute. And it's just letting that breathe and letting, and we shot that scene for a reason, you know? And I was, I was setting that reason aside for the sake of a running time that was arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And by letting that breathe, it then had the impact that it needed to have and the correspondence it has later to the portrait that Gawain has later in the film. All those things start to just make more sense when you get to spend a little bit of time with them. Um, so that was the biggest change, that real two. I mean, there were changes everywhere. I, I, I went in and just worked on the pacing, worked on the, the rhythms of it, but they were all you know fine tuning. It wasn't like I was like adding in more of something or taking out more of something. I was just letting it breathe more, quickening it when it needed to be uh, sped up, but really just trying to let the the scenes work the way I'd intended them to when I shot the film, rather than trying to like get audiences out the door in under two hours. Sure. 
Mm. That's awesome. Makes sense. David, I got to jump to this because you mentioned the concept of a too quick year. Um, and I, I just want to know if you guys ever had a conversation about what might have happened uh, if Gawain at the end of that year just decided, like, I'm not going. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had that conversation in the screenwriting process because it's a hard, it's hard to justify his, you know, his journey. Yeah. It's, it, it doesn't really makes sense that he would actually like hold himself to this because we don't in the 21st century hold honor and chivalry to the same, by the same standards that uh, a knight of that era would have mm -hmm. um, in the same way that like a duel to the death makes no sense now. Like you would not like, you know, <laughs> slap someone with a glove and challenge them to do a duel. You're just like, that doesn't make any sense. Like why would we do <laughs> right, right. Like, there's, a, there's a better way. Um, so in writing the script, I had to, figure out how to justify the fact that he does not just call it quits and not go on the journey. <laughs> and that, that, that was really why I made him Gawain and not Sir Gawain, you know, the, why I deprived mm. him of his knighthood and gave him a place to get to, because then you can kind of understand those stakes with, it's it just, it makes a little bit more sense in terms of like when King Arthur says, tell me a tale of thyself so that I might know thee. And he says, I have none to tell. And suddenly you're like, okay, now I kind of get it. Now you get why he engages the Green Knight in the first place. Now you kind of understand why he goes on that journey. You understand the stakes of honor and chivalry in that world a little bit more. And it just gets a little bit clearer. It's a little bit more binary, a little more black and white. And I miss, to a certain extent, the texture of the poem. The fact that Gawain in the poem is already a virtuous knight and yet still has these doubts and these fears. But it just was, it wasn't working as a screenplay mm. if I, if I went on that path. And so I made that one change and hence he was able to uh, set out and yeah. march out to the castle and, uh, and go on his journey. And we have a, a movie that is two hours long rather than 20 minutes long. <laughs> the 20, 20 minutes. Yeah. I, I kept justifying it to myself as I was watching it. Like I asked the same question. I'm like, why would he go on the journey? I said, well, if he doesn't go on the journey, the Green Knight's gonna come back and kill him or something like that. That's, that's kind of how I thought about it in my perspective. That works too. Yeah, once you, once you have that, like once, you, once the stakes are there, Right. It all kind of clicks and it makes sense and you feel that 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 sense of weight. But um, but that was one of the, the biggest challenges in the screenwriting process was just like making myself just believe that he would go on the journey because <laughs> I said he wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I find it so fascinating that you edit your own feature film here. And, and, and obviously that's a really interesting thing because in terms of major feature filmmaking, you don't normally see directors editing their own films. I mean, you think about some of the greatest directors of all time who have like consistent editors like Tarantino with Sally Menken or now Fred Raskin yeah. and uh, Scorsese with, you know, with Thelma. Uh, I was wondering in terms of as you're on the day directing, um, in terms of your mindset, since you are editing the film, are you able to go home with your shots since you're shooting digitally? And are, are, are you already starting to piece things together? And how does being the editor on your film affect the way you shoot on the day in terms of the takes you do and the angles that you do and the coverage that you do? And I know I was reading a story the other day, it took you a year to edit the Christmas scene, which is yeah. incredible to me. So I was just curious about how editing plays into the day of direction and kind of, and if, and if you want to speak on the why the Christmas day scene took a year to to edit it's just interesting those are very interesting things to me yeah i mean that scene took a year to edit just because it was really complex and we didn't have enough footage to cut it like exactly the way i wanted to we, we didn't have that much time to shoot that sequence you know in the script it was probably like five or six pages and we were like okay we'll shoot that in five days and it was like oh god we could have you know we could have spent three weeks on that scene and and um and in, but in lieu of that you know i just really you know pulled out all the stops and like using tricks to make the scene feel the way I wanted it to feel to like use shots from other parts of the scene to like make up coverage that didn't exist, so on and so forth. Um, and, and that just takes trial and error. Like the first cut was good um, because Sean Harris is amazing and Dev is amazing and Ralph is amazing and everybody's amazing <laughs> in it. But it was like, it was probably like 40 minutes long. And and I was like, we can't, you know, start the movie this way. <laughs> it, needs to, it needs to get through this more quickly. And finding ways to, to expedite it without cutting it off at the knees just was a lot of fine tuning. And then just finding the rhythm, finding that rhythm within it so that it builds in the proper way. Um, it really just, it took that time. And it wasn't that I was like working on it nonstop for a year, but there's like, that was the first thing I cut because it was the beginning of the movie. And then, uh, and then I really just kept revisiting it and revisiting it and revisiting it. And uh, Johnny, our sound mixer, really had to, he mixed every single version of that. He was probably just like, oh my God, a new one. But, 
But to talk about editing while on set, like my mindset as an editor on set, it definitely plays into it. I definitely, you know, from movie to movie, it sort of changes. Mm-hmm. With The Old Man and the Gun, I was erring on the side of how little coverage can I get away with on this movie? Like how little can we shoot and make it still work? Now on this movie, on Green Knight and, and on Peter Pan, Wendy, which I just finished, I'm erring on the side of more. Like I just want more stuff. I want more material. I want to, I want to be able to fine tune it in a way that um, is very precise. And every shot, you know, every line has a specific shot to it. I'm a big believer in like, uh, you know, rather than doing like 16 takes of a scene, do like eight takes of it and then do eight takes on another lens so that you can cut to a new lens mm-hmm. when you have a moment of import to get to. Like if a, lo- if a certain line needs to land differently, a subtle lens change will work wonders. And so I always yeah. am trying to, you know, get those, those extra bits of coverage that will allow me to cut a scene so that everything lands specifically in it with, with the import necessary. But um, I didn't do that much editing while we were shooting, I'd go home every day with a hard drive of everything. Um, and we were, you know, transcoding on set and I'd usually get everything but the last card. And, and then if I needed to put my mind at ease, I would cut something together. I think the wow. first thing I did, the first, the second day of shooting was um, the scene where he sees the giants. And I remember cutting that together that night and, oh, cool. and, then, and, and then just sending it to Weta and being like, I think this is it. And they basically started working on it. Right <laughs> <there>. <laughs> um, That's awesome. And, and then a lot of the stuff with uh, Joel Edgerton and Alyssa Vikander later at that castle, that was a really hard sequence to shoot. And we both myself and Presley, my assistant editor, we were cutting that while we were shooting just to make sure that it was working. Hmm. Um, wow. Not because... It was really, that, that was a sequence where I was really, you know, we um, had a lot of things working against us in that whole sequence, whether it was weather or locations or the fact that I got really sick and literally couldn't, I lost my voice completely and I had to communicate with handwritten notes. So I was like at my wits end in that sequence. Did you like really hold like, up a sign that said action? Like whenever it was time at the beginning? <laughs> I had, thankfully had a, an assistant director who call action, but I'd go, <laughs> I'd go up in between takes. And then, I mean, that's certainly like, I would try to talk and I would just be like, so with this one, please try. <laughs> oh, it was so bad. Um, uh, but it, it definitely, I'm thinking about the edit while shooting constantly. Cool. I'm never not thinking about it. And I'm thinking like, oh, from this moment, we can cut to this and then we can cut to this. And that's not, sometimes it's planned out. Sometimes we shoot things and they work out exactly as I intended. But when you're, you know, watching a scene unfold, you see those cut points present themselves to you. And you're like, oh, this, I was intending to cut out on this shot, but actually that's the one we're going to cut out on. And I'll just make a mental note to myself uh, to remember that, which I'm pretty good at remembering. And, Mm -hmm. and they just, that usually works that you, the things you see on set usually are what I will go to first. And, and by and large, they do work, but you know, there's always that process of discovery and reinvention that, um, that occurs on every movie. But that being said, when I get back to the final cut of any one film, it's not that different from the first assembly. I'll go on, I'll go on tangents, but then you get back to it and it's really just a refined version of that initial assembly. Wow. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting. David, um, Ralph Ineson obviously does such an amazing job as the Green Knight. Um, I'm curious as to two things. One, was that ever physically him in the suit? And then also, like, what kind of direction you give someone for a performance like that? Because we never really get to know the Green Knight very well. So I'm sort of curious, what sort of motivations does he have as an actor that maybe we don't even get to know as as an audience member? It was always him. Like, he was there every day. Even when his head gets cut off, he's got, like, a blue stocking on his head. Um, And I don't want to pretend that that makeup was comfortable but he never complained. I was like incredible. Like, you know, his eyes have these contact lenses that look like, you know, wood. And I don't know how well he could see. I know they had to poke a hole in his neck to let sweat drip out. Oh, like oh wow. <laughs> God. That's and cool. There's like ever a scene where he didn't have to wear the hands. I know like if the, the, there was just no, you know, there was no, it was just, he was completely encased. Um, and it was so weird. The, the days that we would shoot the scenes where his head got cut off and he had that blue stocking were the only times we ever really saw him because he would just go, he'd get there so early to begin the makeup process. And then he would still be getting the makeup off when we would all leave for the day. So we just never saw him as Ralph. We would just see him as the Green Knight, which was helpful in some ways uh, for us. But it was also just nice to re- be reminded that 
this actor that we know and love was actually underneath it when he had the blue stocking on his head. Um, and then as far as direction, you know, the scene in the green, in the Camelot and at Christmas, the first scene with him, he just had to be imposing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of physicality to it. And there's a lot of stuff that he brought to the table. And there's that moment where he just like spreads his arms wide. And that wasn't something we planned on. He just did that. And I was like, whoa, that's an incredible moment. And I, again, talking about editing, I was like, oh, we'll get a wide shot of that. And we're just going to cut to that right before. And it was one of those things that just, you see, you see how the scene works when you're, when you're watching an actor make a decision like that. But for the final scene, which we shot over the course of three days, we, you know, I had two notes. One was like, when you wake up, it's like we're Ben Winkle. You've been asleep for a thousand years and you just have a sleepiness to you. And then that sleepiness becomes delight because you're so happy. You're genuinely happy that he has returned. And for that final beat of the movie, the final exchange, my direction was just play it like you're Santa Claus. (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome and he got that he got that and he does that and it's one of my favorite things to see <laughs> that's amazing david i wish we had so much more time with you i understand you have a hard out so we have to let you go here but uh oh, such a pleasure yeah this was delightful uh i'm so glad you, you made the time and, and hopefully we get you back sometime soon anytime anytime thank you all. so much man that was cool. awesome thank you appreciate it Thanks, david. congratulations on your film man thank you we want to thank David Lowry for coming on the show. A terrific conversation and definitely uh, want everybody to go out and see The Green Knight as long as you uh, feel safe and comfortable, go see it in the theaters because it's really, really remarkable. Kev, you got a chance to revisit it because you were saying the first time you watched it, you weren't really in the best uh, headspace for it or it wasn't, it wasn't what you expected it to be. So you got to see it again. Yeah, and I, one thing I've learned as I've gotten older, and this is just maybe me maturing and, and understanding that it's okay to have like shifts in, in mindset and kind of sure. like you may not be in the right headspace when you see something. Because I feel like growing up, like if you if you saw a film, like you your your, fir, your first impression of it was your definitive impression, and I would always like defend that impression. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that like I think any of us could know this. When you sit down for a film, you go into it with certain expectations. You go into it with, with whatever day you've already lived prior to walking in that theater and so when i saw the green knight for the first time i was expecting a very different film that was that's on me though i mean like uh, uh, that's my expectations based on trailer or hype or uh visuals or whatever i was seeing prior to the film so i sat down expecting a little bit more of a quickly a quicker paced film more action uh less internal less thought provoking and not not that i wasn't expecting to be thinking during the film i just wasn't expecting the film that it, that it delivered right so mm-hmm. um i just didn't in i didn't think that that experience warranted my review yet because i didn't feel confident in what i had seen or i felt like my mind was wandering too much i kept thinking like wait this isn't like the trailer or whatever it was Mm -hmm. um and i think i I misspoke on our show when we first reviewed this um about a24 because i forgot all the crazy great films a24 a24 um has made in 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 the history of the studio i mm-hmm. i always looked at like spring breakers or midsummer or whatever my mindset was in terms of what an a24 film like zola or something like that but then i realized like we went through the list and there was so many other ones right so and you I watch just ghost wasn't... story too ghost story I, to oh, me. Yeah, so like i think of, whenever i think of like a24 i think more leaning to and granted they've got a wide variety of films but i think yeah. more ghost story yeah, and, and yeah. films like you know Spring Breakers being the exception. Yeah, so in in in, in A twenty four, like in, in, there's a very specific vibe. So as I as I saw the Green Knight for the first time, I wasn't I wasn't feeling it thematically. I was blown away by it visually. Um, and then I sat down and watched it this weekend. I, I I watched it first in theaters, and then I watched it at home. Uh, mm-hmm. I bought it on the uh, whatever the nineteen ninety nine rental was on iTunes. Which real quick, I just want to say I'm so glad they did that because there are a lot of people who don't feel comfortable going back to the theaters just yet, and they're hearing really good things yeah. about this movie, or and even so don't it, have access to it. Exactly, right. and so A twenty four made it available for one night only, which was terrific. Yeah, although then it went then it went paid VOD, didn't it? Yeah, I was say I think which, it's I think it's out there now. Yeah, okay. so I watched it on th- so the Wednesday was the one night only the K N I G H T and then the yeah. and then the Thursday went to went to V O D. Um, it I I gotta tell you as I sat there and watched it in a much more relaxed fashion in terms of I uh, just not ex- not throwing my expectations at the screen, letting Lowry tell me what the story is versus me telling the the, the film what the story is supposed to be or what it's supposed to be like. Thematically, it's it's incredible. Um, and in terms of visual storytelling, it's some of the best visual narrative storytelling I've seen. Um, I still I like the film a lot. I actually really like the film. I wouldn't say I'm on the love it 
train yet. Mm. Um, it took me three times to fall in love with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So I'm going to give Green Knight more viewings. But on my second viewing, what I really latched on to was just how personal the film feels. Um, mm. And David Lowry's voice really comes through the visuals. But in terms of Dev Patel's performance, that struck me a lot harder this time around. Sean Harris's performance uh, struck me a lot harder this time around. The whole Christmas scene uh, Christmas Day scene struck me a lot harder in terms of like what was happening narratively, what this character was going through, Dev Patel's character, and kind of what that journey was. And then that question of why he would actually take the journey a year later. Um, and that became a whole thing. I, I watched the film from a very different um, thematic standpoint this time around, but also the visuals played in with the thematic so beautifully that and the score, Daniel Hart's score really jumped out at me this time around as well. I also, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, was the budget on this movie $15 million? I remember reading that somewhere. Can someone check on that? Because I have absolutely no idea how he made this film for whatever, if it's allegedly $15 million. He is million. really, I'm reading a lot of interviews with him before we got a chance to talk to him. He is super um, in tune with not overspending, like keeping everything in line and, and doing yeah. it for the most economical amount of he just doesn't want to, you know, go into it and blow. A t like he's very conscious of that. So I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if it was somewhere around there. Yeah, that's, I think that, I read. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah, it's 15. Yeah. Wow. Okay. 15 million. I mean, if you think about, well, first of all, he has a lot of location shots in that film. A lot of it's actually already there. But from a costume design perspective, mm. I loved the, I just loved the costumes. Like everything about this film, it's almost expertly, precisely made. Every mm. shot is like like Jake will say this you could put the shot on your wall as a painting every single frame in this film works like that um this time around my second viewing I was more invested in his journey the mm. second the first time I watched it I, I I wasn't I was so I was so out of it in terms of like oh wait what's happening here I didn't understand why Alicia Vikander was playing two different characters I didn't follow that because my my head was kind of like this is not the movie that I expected it to be. Yeah. So all of it kind of fell into place for me this time, which really felt cathartic in terms of the viewing experience. So mm -hmm. I, I really like the film a lot. I, I still don't necessarily think I love it overall. I'm just, but I'm right on that cusp where I'm at a four out of five uh, for the film. Jake, where'd cool. you, would you give it? The more and more I separate myself, like the time passes, I start, I ha now I have not seen it again. Um, but with like I, every day, I, here's what I say is I find myself thinking about it almost every day which is a huge deal for me as a, with everything that we have and everything we're seeing at all states going on. Um, the fact that I'm still thinking about a movie I saw a month plus ago uh, makes me love it a little bit more every day. But where are you at rating wise out of five? Oh God, I don't know. Four and a half probably. Okay. So I'm going to it a five. I gave it a five. It, a five. But it I, would I, be I, my favorite this. thing this year until I saw Coda and then Coda. Coda! I love Coda I, just, so much. I will say this real fast before I go. I, I went back and watched a ghost story for the first time because I watched Green Knight and I was so struck by the visual storytelling and kind of after our interview, learning a lot about the narrative uh, decisions he makes in terms of lenses and, and, and things like that. I believe Ghost Story only costs a hundred thousand dollars to make. And from correct me if I'm wrong, I think Casey Affleck is under the sheet the entire time. Um if I if I if I understand that correctly. Um, I don't know if I remember it. I hate that movie, by the way. I oh, can't I can't I, I think I can't a ghost story it is one of the best films I've seen in over a decade. Oh, like one God. of the best films. Um, wow. but, also, but also, I think the reason why I loved it is it reminded me a lot about Interstellar in terms of the way time <laughs> passes. <laughs> yeah, I know, and Sean nice. doesn't like Interstellar. That makes a lot of so, sense. So, to, to, so, so it really had this great Force Gump Lord of the Rings quality about it. That's really, <laughs> what, that's really what struck me. The best way I would put a ghost story is if you could envision the scene in Interstellar when Matthew McConaughey is watching the video of his kids grow up over to, over over twenty four years or whatever it is, that's what Ghost Story basically is the entire movie. <sighs> like, I mean, I think Ghost Story <laughs> yes, is an yes. astounding that's a, you're achievement. Right. It's yes. also in uh, Jake's favorite aspect ratio, four by three. Yeah. Um, but right. I, 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 but I will say, uh, I uh, the Green Knight definitely impressed me a lot more the second time. Like, I literally, I, I'm giving it a four out of five. It's a very, very good film. I'm not at love it yet, but I need to see it one more time, I believe. But Ghost Story, I think, is Lowry's masterpiece at the moment. Okay. All right. Let's get to uh, talking points. And the Eternals trailer dropped shortly after we recorded. And this one, to me, was the trailer that finally convinced me uh, that I'm super excited for this movie. Because I was, 
you know, listen, I'm the Marvel apologist here on the show. I'm going to stump for everything MCU. Um, but I wasn't feeling uh, what this movie was going to be. I didn't quite, I couldn't quite figure out. And this goes in, this goes a little bit back to personally, um, when we went to the set of this movie, uh, it was a, it was one of the most vague set visits that I've ever been at. And the fact that we didn't get to interview Chloe, um, we only got to speak to Salma, uh, Hayek, the only person in the cast who we got to speak to. Wait, um, Salma who? Hayek? 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 Sam, Salma Hayek. Salma Hayek. Hayek. Yes. Um, Hayek, thank you. And, what did you um, say, Hayek? I might have said Hayek. <laughs> I might have. <laughs> um, and you are nothing if not on brand. We just didn't get a sense, even at the set, that they knew what the movie was going to be, which was really mm -hmm. unusual. And... Salma was like saying in her interviews, like, you know, uh, I didn't have a script, you know, like they just called me and said, like, it's a Marvel movie. And and like at, at one point I said, I was sitting next to our friend, uh, Brandon Davis, and we were both like, is that unusual? And she's like, totally like this never happens before. Like normally we know everything we're doing, but we're just here trusting in this in this director and trusting in, in Marvel. Um, and so even in those first two trailers, like you could tell that they were like setting the stage for this group that's been around for a really long time. But finally, with this trailer, it explained uh, the deviants and the uh, idea of the celestials, which are these beings that are even more powerful than the Eternals and the deviants. Um, it's just I, I went back and reread these comics a lot. Like I didn't read them a ton growing up. So I went back to try to revisit them. And it's really tough to get into. Like, I can't quite tell how they're going to make it into a movie. I think guess the answer is they're just going to change it completely. And but but seeing it now, it brought up a lot of the themes which Jake was talking about earlier in the weekly poll section. Um, if if they've been around this amount of time and they haven't interfered for all these different reasons, and I like the fact that there's a line in the trailer that at least addresses it, but I feel like they need to talk about it a little bit yeah. more. Um, because because I think the line is that intrigued me was we were told not to interfere, and someone asked a question like by who. Yeah. So who who told you not to interfere? Exactly. Um, the cast looks great. I kind of like the fact now, I get the sense that they have been around for so long that they're almost unfazed by a lot of stuff that happens to them. And there's this kind of um, mentality that they uh, are, are above it all, and they probably are above it all. And and again, like Jake is saying, it, it moves. it's moving the MCU in a direction where it's kind of remarkable that we celebrated the Infinity Saga and the fact that they were able to lay this foundation. And now they're truly able to go to a lot of different exciting places. And and I, we've been saying that, but to see them do it is is kind of crazy. And I know we have a, a batch of sequels coming up next with Doctor Strange and Thor Love and Thunder and Guardians 3. But I feel like each of those now has the potential, especially if Doctor Strange goes in the places that we want it to go, that they're not just traditional sequels, that they really can expand out the type of storytelling that's being done. And this most recent uh, Eternals trailer really did sell me on the fact that it's going to be something big and something special. And that's beyond, you know, just the fact that if they let Chloe do what Chloe Zhao is able to do, um, then then we'll see where it goes. Jakey, where were you at if you saw this most recent trailer? Yeah, I agree. The first trailer, you know, I don't want to repeat too much of what I already said. The first trailer didn't do a ton for me, but it was one of those like, look, I'm going to see it anyway, so what does it matter? Um, but this one was the first one where I was like, oh, but not just got me excited for uh, this film, but also got me excited for the direction that that like, Phase Four, if we're still calling them in phases, yeah. um, that, that that Marvel's going in. Um, because it almost you almost do kind of have to like throw out the book and sort of say okay we gotta we gotta start we can't just do another Infinity Saga we gotta we gotta mm -hmm. do something else because we don't have these guys well, we don't have a lot of these guys anymore so what can we do that's gonna surprise people yep. um, and even in the whole like multiverse I don't want to call it a bit but like that angle there are so many only so many old school actors from past franchises you can bring back so you can only really milk that for so long mm -hmm. there still needs to be new progressive moving forward expanding storylines. And I think Eternals looks like it's going to be tapping into that, hopefully. Have you loved the fact that it said uh, from Academy Award winner, Chloe Shaw? Yeah, that was incredible. I mean, first of all, I don't know why that was missing from the... Because it wasn't... Didn't the first trailer come out either when she was yeah. a nominee or a winner? And they didn't no, it came it out after there. she won. Yeah, sure. and it wasn't... Which really didn't make any sense to me. Like, I was like, why aren't they, why aren't they capitalizing on that? Will, it was will Love and cut. Thunder say that? Uh, because he won. No, it, no, it won't say. It won't say Academy. Yeah, but it was so. But it could say from Academy Award winner Taika Waititi. 
I don't know if they would do that because he's a writer. I don't know. I mean, they do that with Matt Damon all the time. It's an Oscar. True. Um, all right. Well, in terms, yeah, the, this trailer I thought was gorgeous. I mean, obviously it has, it has a very Nomad Land feeling to it, which is interesting to see kind of in the MCU. But I also like the fact that it seems like it's its own movie outside of the MCU. I mean, there's MCU ties clearly. They're bringing it all into the trailer. But I like that the film still feels like its own thing, like just the yeah. way it's shot, the cinematography. But from a war- Academy Award winning director, you know, that made me really happy because that was a really cool thing to see in the MCU. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Did did Brana ever win a uh, director uh, Oscar? I don't think no. so. Don't he think didn't so. win for Hamlet, uh, or did he win? For, he won for acting, right? Did he win for? Does he have an Oscar? I don't think, I think he does. Bro, I don't think he. The only reason I was asking is because they didn't do that for Brana when they did four. I don't, think I, but I don't know if Oscar. he ever won an Oscar. Okay, but either way, I'm no. I think the trailer was was fantastic. I, I thought for some reason I thought Brana had an Oscar, but I guess not. Gabe, Gabe's looking up. Uh, let's transition off the Eternals, and I want to get your guys' impressions of Spider-Man. We haven't talked since it aired. Yes, Gabe, I'm sorry, you're muted. Before you transition off the thing I was looking at, um, he's been nominated for four Oscars. He's never won. Cool. Mm, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Best director once and actor for Henry V. Uh, best short film with for Swan Song. Best writing for Hamlet. And then best performance for My Week with Marilyn. Huh. Oh, wow. The only reason what? I brought that up is because I was, uh, yeah. In a supporting he, role. He was in that? I was just supposed to say, I don't remember him in that movie. Sounds like he don't was remember. a big deal in that. Yeah. It sounds like he was he in was. that movie. <laughs> I guess he was, if he got an Oscar for it. Um, we haven't talked fully uh, since the Spider-Man trailer dropped just last night. Is that just last night? Uh, that's I insane. So. Um, yeah. Why don't you guys tell me first what you think about it, starting with Kev. Where are you at? Well, I mean, the Hello Peter line is just... I mean, so... You guys know this on Spider-Man two next to far from home was my favorite Spider-Man movie uh, ever. Like, and Sean, we used to discuss this in the show. You used to not like Spider-Man two. And I used to have to convince you that Spider-Man two was actually awesome. I don't know if you go back and find that audio. I know there's that audio. Uh, It's not that I didn't like Spider-Man two. Um, I have some issues with Spider-Man two that prevent it from being my favorite, my favorite of them all. No, Find the but audio. You used to you you did not as, as like Spider Man Two. As the kids Spider-Man say, check 2. the receipts. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I, listen, I I love Spider Man Two, but I think it has some because whenever anything gets overpraised, it bothers me. Right? I think we've realized that that's a trend. So for people to call it the best Spider Man movie of all time, that that bothers me a little bit because there's things about it that bo- that that annoy me. Um, as someone who's like a purist, like I don't like things that they did with Mary Jane. I don't like the fact that Spider-Man gave up his powers, all this jazz. Um, I still think Homecoming is the better representation of Spider-Man on screen, but Spider-Man 2 for what they accomplished at that time is pretty remarkable. And somebody brought up an idea in a tweet today that they're like, it's pretty strange that the fight between Dr. Octopus and Spider-Man that starts on the top of the building and falls down onto the train has never been topped. And it's true. There's no other fight in a Spider-Man movie that is better than that fight sequence. Yeah. Um, I would say that's right. And that's almost 20 years ago. We're coming up on 20 years. I can't wait for the Real Blend episode where Sean randomly drops like, you know what movie I love? Forrest Gump. It's never never going (laughs) to happen. We're we're going to say like... Never happen. But... In terms of this, this 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 new trailer, I mean, Doc Ock is my favorite villain uh, in a Spider-Man film that I've seen. I mean, I yeah. love Mysterio as well. Um, though I would actually argue the Mysterio hallway fight scene when when oh. they were, he was when he was doing all the different effects and everything that's one of the best Spider-Man fights ever. It's um, insane. It's an incredible fight scene. Uh, I also love that he was just kind of a filmmaker, Mysterio, and he was kind of playing around with like you know those the projections and stuff. But in terms of this trailer, yeah, seeing Doc Ock back was just everything I wanted. I mean, it was, it's an, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliantly cut together trailer. Everything that they, they touch on so many different things. The Doctor Strange stuff was awesome. Um, obviously Holland's my favorite Spider-Man to date. So I just love, I love his Peter Parker. I love his Spider-Man. I love watching him interact in the world. Uh, I love the idea of him dealing with this concept of people knowing who he is now and that, and how mm-hmm. that emotionally affects him. Uh, I love seeing that and kind of like when him and Zendaya were just hanging out on that look, look like a rooftop where they can mm-hmm. get away from all the noise. And then he goes back into the world and it's just pounding at him. And he asks to, you know, ask Dr. Strange to put that spell where everyone forgets he's you know, Peter Parker and Spider-Man. So, but the Doc Ock sequence is, that's, that's, that's the gold right there. That, that's the, that's what gets yeah. me in the theater. I, I would already have gone, but hearing him say, hello, Peter. Now here's my question. 
Do you think he's saying hello, Peter, to to Holland Spider Man? I don't know because you know how they, Marvel or, cuts their trailers. Right. I think they cut that in a way where he's probably actually saying that to Tobey Maguire. But the way they cut it in the trailer he, is is they make it look like it's Holland. I don't know. That might not be a thing because here's the here's the consistent thing: the three villains that they have coming back are Goblin, Electro, and Doc Ock. But also. Right. All the, Toby, the trailer, all to, the, oh, the Toby trailer seems to also show what a lot of people are calling Lizard and Sandman. Correct. Yes. Potentially. But but here's the thing. Yes. Well, well hang on. Let me let me finish that point. Go ahead, finish your those thought. three characters mm. die in their movies. Yes. And Alfred Molina had come out and said that oh it's it's I get pulled into this universe from the moment when my character is dying at the bottom of the lake. They pull me into this universe. That's what he's said Correct. in this interview. Yes. The problem with bringing back any of the other Spider-Men is if, if the reason they're going for these characters is, oh, we can take these characters that died in their universes, pull them into this one, and we don't have to worry about whatever going on in that other universe that happened. We don't have to worry about tampering with that. We don't have to worry about trying to say, like, are those still existing? If they pull the other Spider-Men in who continue to live, who, you know... When their series were done, were still a thing. Mm. But who's to say that it's you can't pull different people for? Because if you're pulling Defoe right before he died and Molina right before he died, yes. what's to say you can't pull Maguire from a different? Because if you of pull time? Maguire, people go, okay, well then when does Maguire like we have to? When does he get pulled? What happens well, next? Well, you're pulling, like, but you're already pulling two different. If you're pulling Defoe and Molina, you're already pulling two different people from two different periods of time. It's not about two different. Universe. So you're missing my point. My point is they're pulling people who have a definitive storyline and there's there have a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Their story's done. They can go, it's kind of clean for us to grab this character yeah. okay. and put it in this story without mucking up what already was a different movie. But, but, if, we're already, but if we're pulling 40-year-old Tobey Maguire, maybe the story is like, by that point, he's kind of already hung it up. And he's like, shit, I got to do yeah. this again. My, my point being, you're, again, you're missing my point, is I, I don't think they want to be that messy. Like, I think uh. that they're pulling, these characters they've pulled, the thing that I've noticed that, that they have in common is it's very clean for them to bring them in get us excited but yeah. they don't have to worry about putting them back so you don't I think mean, mcguire and garfield are in the movie i think, I think that i think that we should be just as excited now as we yeah, were before yeah. this trailer see i i yeah i, I, don't, think agree we, I, don't, I don't think we have I, any more hype than we did i think before. we need to be careful to you know in and in, in almost green knight fashion kevin i think we need to accept the movie mm -hmm. they're giving us not the movie we want it to be yeah. That well, being said, I think yeah. it's going to happen. I'm just not too. entirely sure it's going to happen in this movie. I really, I tell a lot of people Sean's idea that they're setting up Sinister Six and Sinister, Sinister Six is the reason they're going to have to bring back the, the other two Spider-Men. But see, haven't we seen like images of like Maguire and Garfield in Atlanta? Like aren't those? Like, I, I, I thought I thought the whole idea is that they we haven't we haven't there's seen a them. There's a Garfield photo making the rounds of him in his suit. Yes. A new um, one? A new one. Yes. I'll text I haven't you. seen I'll, that. I'll send it to you. I'll, it to you. I'll, I'll drop it into the thread right now. I, I'm, I am. All right. Here's the thing. Today's August 24th. I want everyone on record right now. Are Garfield and Maguire in the movie? I'm saying yes. Yes, 100%. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm saying yes. If I had to put money down, I'm saying yes. I hope but I so. Also, yeah. yeah, I hope so. But I also, it's also really important to me not to, because also like, I was talking to uh, you know frequent listener of the show Chase about this today. Like, I love the trailer, I really did. But like, there's just so much like the discourse around this movie, and the anticipation and the predictions is getting to a boiling point of like kind of ruining is a strong word, but like I am try I need to start trying to remove myself because it's otherwise the it's going to be social media age we live yeah. in. Yeah, but I feel like more so this movie than we've seen in a long time. Well, um, I'm telling you, I'm telling you I think we're getting to a point and I think this movie's going to be a breaking point for a lot of people where the so social media has given us so much access to behind the scenes movie news. Yeah. And it and it's 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 involving us so much in the process now that when you actually sit down for the film there's no way that you're not going into that film with certain expectations based on the way social media has driven up the hype sure. for a film. And it, it's kind of like going back in the day when like when you would go to a movie and you would like I found out that Lost World was coming yeah. out mm. by by Lost watching Indian a trailer yeah. before another movie. Like, oh my god, yeah. they're making another Jurassic or Park. Or like when you I saw a poster. I remember I remember right. seeing the Freddy versus Jason poster in in a they theater lobby that? and going like right. Oh my God! Freddy right. vs. Jason are in the same movie. Oh my God! Like, like I flipped. Right. And, 
And think about it from this perspective. At that moment in time, you knew nothing about the production. Yeah. And the movie's already done yeah. and ready yeah, to come out. Yeah, they're promoting it. Yeah. Could you and, imagine and like, if we knew yeah. nothing and then we saw Melina pop okay, up in that trailer? Okay, Wish. but here's the thing. No, I, I get. I know what you're gonna say, but I, just, I, I, I get, I'm, I get I'm, the I'm, age I'm, we live in. Yeah, I'm just. I think this is gonna be a. Br- I, I yearn think this for film, simpler times. I think this film is is going to show us that we're going a little yeah. too far. Yeah, like, can we that's can we my, all just chill out a little just bit? Step it back a little bit. Like, well, that's why I, I, actually everything's I, news. You know, I put a poll up on social media where I asked Spider-Man fans in the second trailer because you know there's gonna be another trailer. Do you want to see Andrew and Toby, or would you like them safe I for the movie? I kind of don't. I yeah. see. I would argue you almost get out of get it out of the way now because no, because save uh, it. Here, here's the thing. At this save point, it. it's almost it's almost it's almost. But here's the thing: once the movie comes out that Thursday, everyone's gonna be ruined for everybody, no well, matter who's no, seen that's, it or not. That's different. Stop. That's different. That you you can avoid a weekend. You can do no. protect the end game. You can do protect yeah, the you end can, game. You can do protect the end game, and you as a consumer can just stay the fuck off the internet. Like I I, I don't. Uh, yes. If it's that important to you, then stay off until you Marvel can see Marvel fans can keep a secret. A lot of Endgame secrets were kept for almost a week and a but half. But you, you also just don't have to go on Twitter. Like, you can spend a true. couple weeks not going to, on Twitter. Yeah, like, but then your true. friends see it. Their friends text you. I, 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 I think well, we that's, are Well, in... that's not your problem. That's a different thing. You have thing. to remember, too, tell... the age that we're in, Kev, that, like, even as we're discussing this trailer... If I went home and asked Michelle a question about it, she'd be like, "What are you talking about? Like, there's another yeah. Spider-Man movie coming? Like, we are immersed. We're I hope they save immersed. it. I hope. I hope that when I go yeah. in the theater, I go. I still feel the same way I do now, which is it'd be really cool if they're in there. But man, I don't know. Like, yeah, Dave, I, yeah, I, 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 I want to see it in the theater. Don't get me wrong. I, the only reason I said I want they should reveal it in the second trailer is because we already know so much. My, my point but we don't is, know that that's true. We don't know. Dave, that that's the minute certain. you sit down in that theater, you're already going to know before it happens. You're already going to know. I know. No, no, well, I'm asking no, that I we're all going to see. It. Let's be honest. We're all going to see it early. Oh, so cool. yeah. uh, here's the thing. No, what I was saying is that we're we're overthinking it from this perspective. Let's let's at least just talk about what we've been shown. Sure. They have figured out a story where it is credible that Doctor Strange casts a spell to correct a problem from the previous Spider-Man movie of his mm-hmm. identity and has fig- and has mistakenly opened up a multiverse that has allowed mm-hmm. these characters to show up. Does he does does he mess up the spell because because Peter tries to like like Needle Don't let pick this it a person bit. know who I am. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Does, it, does the spell? I was trying to watch, figure that's that out. In the, the way it's cut. I don't know if that's yeah. actually yeah. what happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, that moment, I'm to me, I was of two minds. I feel better about it the more I think about it. But it kind of feels like um, it's kind of interesting because it kind of feels like a animated series episode stakes mm. of like, oh, he went and talked to Doctor Strange, and a problem happened. We need to solve this problem by the end of the episode. Right. Yeah. Which almost I worry like is that going to feel too convenient or too small in this? Just giant like movie? the it's it's a wonderful life of Spider Man. But I feel better and better more I think about it because my the second half of my mind goes to I kind of love that if in a post in game Marvel they can just smash two elements of their universe together and we get a cool story. Like yeah. I, I'm cool with that. If like, we know at, who Doctor Strange is. Rock. We yeah we know we know who these two characters are. Let's just put them in a scene together. Yeah, and then let's get a story out of that. And again, we're cool. at a point where there's a universe where those two getting together to to discuss this wouldn't be it's not un, unreasonable. Yeah, you know, like right. they're both New, New York. Heroes. And hopefully, you don't spend the first half of your runtime trying to build up and explain well, no, it. You can just that's what I want to get to the point of. I really do believe that we have barely scratched the surface um, of what this movie is going to reveal because I've heard a number of rumors of things that are going to happen and a good number of them pan out to what was shown in this trailer, um, which would indicate to me that we've really only seen the, wow. the beginning, the beginning and, of and all of this. I do want to clarify, I, 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 you know, in terms of the reveal of Maguire and, and, and Garfield, I don't want to know that. Uh, the, the argument I was making was that we are in such an, in a digital age that everything is is so available to us yes. that it almost might benefit it just to have it out there. That's the only reason I said that. I, I how, still want to sit in the theater and have that scene happen for me before knowing it. Don't get me wrong. Here's I, why I, I agree I with you from this perspective, much. Kev. That's all. Um, when the trailer got leaked, because we're coming, we're recording this after the trailer got leaked, and it wasn't even the trailer. It was like a Final Cut Pro version of the trailer. It was like. One of the that's that was the joke at the beginning of the show. It was like one of the worst possible ways 
that a fan could have experienced uh, the first trailer for this anticipated movie. And then in a way for like a day, I was mad at Marvel and Sony for holding it as long as they did. Um, After because the week. N- no beforehand, uh, like everyone's been clamoring for this trailer for so long and they weren't giving it to the fans. And I'm not saying right. that it forced somebody to leak it, but it allowed someone to get ahead of the marketing campaign. And so I wish that Marvel and Sony wasn't, weren't being so cute with it and just put it out. Like if you had it, release it, you know? Yeah. Um, but you know, that's, that's the best case scenario. They didn't know that this was going to come out. So at the latest, I would have thought it dropped after Loki's finale. Like at the latest, I would have thought like once the stakes of Loki were established, they would go, okay, look at what's happening in Spider-Man. But so why not, why not just save it for Shang-Chi's opening weekend and push the the theater for that? That might have well, been I think plan. that's still the plan. I think they still yeah. want to put it ahead of Shang Chi and force out. people to go to the theater. Well, there are fans. I'm raising my hand who will go to the theater specifically to see that trailer on the big screen. Oh, don't don't no question. I I'm just yeah. thinking from a marketing perspective. Like Kevin Feige, could you imagine the selling point? He goes, all right, get there Thursday and Friday night to watch Shang Chi because yeah. Shang Chi might not might need more of a push that's in terms of like. Uh, Right, and all of a sudden you go, Kevin Feige's like, all right, what if, like if you you because Sean well, interviewed Feige recently, and and you asked Feige about the No Way Home trailer. If Feige said in that interview, and this became a mm-hmm. news story, I'm gonna be debuting the Spider Man No Way Home trailer on opening night of Shang Chi. Remember oh, they did that? Didn't they do that for episode that be, one? Didn't they put the episode yeah. one trailer? Like, that would have. Well, well, couldn't even say. Well, couldn't that have been? That could it. have been the plan, but this ruined it. I, sure. I imagine. Awesome. No, I, I, sure. Or or was or was the No Way Home trailer always supposed to come out around CinemaCon? That was the other thing I was sure. wondering because. But in all honesty, from a marketing perspective, I don't know if it's a Disney Sony thing because I know they obviously it's Disney, you know, not Sony. They, well, so yeah, no, I know that Shang Chi is Disney, but but with with uh, oh, Spider Man, it's Sony. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering if Feige ever had this idea in his mind that okay, Shang Chi might need a push. Here's what Give I bet you, No Way Home. Here's what I bet you they probably wanted in a perfect scenario: show it at CinemaCon to the audience that's there. Don't release it. Don't it, or don't if, if it didn't release leak, it. Show it on Monday at CinemaCon. Attach it to Shang Chi. Yes. Make people go to the theaters to see it. Put it online right after. I mean, think about that push. You want to see the No Way Home trailer? You have to go see Shang Chi. Because I haven't seen any. Well, I guess it dropped right away. But I was gonna say I haven't seen anybody record it here at CinemaCon and post it. And I know that they're they're pretty uh, tight on security in this coliseum. So I think uh, Shang Chi so anyway, could could have used that. Yeah. It probably could. Um, yeah. We'll get to that in a second. Anyway, I I freaking love it. I, I cannot believe that there is a movie coming that has all these elements in it. It's, I don't I, know. And you're I, writing I'm a curious. book at the exact same time. Yeah, right? That's, that's, <laughs> that's I, I, I have a conversation with a buddy of mine. This is going to sound far more morbid than, than I mean it to be. But what is the movie that in your mind you think like, God, I can't die before I see this movie. And for me, for a long time, it was like episode seven. And then, you know, for, you know, whatever, like, there's always like, okay, what is the movie that, like, God, I just have to live long enough to see that movie. And I think right now, Dune is so tangible that I'm not going to say Dune because, like, I feel like Dune is, is very, very close. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, I, so I'm sort of like, God, I just got to see, for, like, it's, it's No Way Home and then The Flash because I got to see Keaton as, as Batman again. Uh, if I had to go big picture, not even knowing that it's coming, I would love to see a Lord of the Rings style adaptation of uh, Dark Tower. Like, I would love to see the Dark Tower adapted. Oh, no, but it's got to be something that, like, you know is, like, okay, like, this is oh, in the future. Oh, coming? Oh, yeah. it has to be, like, on the horizon? Yeah, yeah. Like, Tenet, like, I gotta Tenet, live... Tenet was the last movie for me for, like, yeah. that. Well, Where, like, I gotta, that, like, no please don't let me get like, hit by a bus before no seeing this movie. No Way Home months from now, I so I'll say, t- I'll say Indy 5. Oh, that's a good one, too. I'll say Indy 5. I mean, I'm more excited about No Way Home than I am Indy 5, though. I oh, yeah, I, am I definitely too. am, too. But that's Sean, like... Sean, No Way Home should be your answer. That's like the that's the well, Sean O'Connell film. I think I'm going to survive till December. <laughs> I know, so. but Jake's point is like, I don't want to get <laughs> hit like, by like, a I don't want to get hit by a bus oh, before yeah. I see this movie. No Way right, Home yeah. has to be your answer. Again, this isn't oh, meant to yeah. be so morbid, but it's just yeah, meant yeah. to be like... Like, you, better better watch both ways before I will cross the street because I want to see No Way I, Home. <laughs> I texted PJ a disturbingly uh, number of times today knowing he was in school and I was just sending him tweets and photos and everything about No Way Home because I know he's getting it on his watch 
And then at one point I was like, I gotta stop distracting him. Like he's at school. <laughs> he's at school. But he was getting back to me like briefly with like like little answers. So um yeah, it's yeah, I'm as fired up for that movie as I could possibly be about anything. So uh let's get to this week in movies, because we have a couple of good movies that are coming out. Uh starting with Flag Day, which I didn't get a chance to see, but the boys got to speak to Sean Penn for it. Uh Kev, how is Flag Day? Uh, I liked Flag Day a lot. I I I think um I think Jake and I are probably in the same boat here. I mean, it's 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 based on a true story. It's based about you know Penn's character is a counterfeiter. You know, he robs banks and he, he's but he's doing it all kind of to provide for his daughter. But he's very mysterious about what he does and like and in, in the film, we, you know, Dylan Penn, his real daughter, comes to live with him and she's trying to figure out what he does and trying to get and he's trying to just get back on track, but he can't fight those demons that are making him go towards the more illegal things that he's doing. Um, I mean, in terms of filmmaking, I mean, I, the shooting on 16 millimeter just kind of like gave it a good time capsule. Uh, I thought it was shot beautifully. Dylan Penn's performance is outstanding. How is she? Uh, She's mean, a good, she, good actress. Phenomenal. Like she is, I mean, I would argue that she steals scenes from Penn, Sean Penn. And I, and I love Sean Penn as an actor. We all do. He's an amazing actor. Um, but we already know Sean Penn's a good actor. So like you sure. just expect greatness from him. Dylan Penn was a surprise. I mean, she looks very much like her mother, Robin Wright. Um, but she's just an outstanding, outstanding actor. And I, I, I was, I was amazed by how emotionally brutal her performance is. Like it's a really hard performance. Like she's just like, a wreck a lot of the film in terms of just like what she's dealing with and you know there's there's this you know time period of her growing up and younger versions of herself and younger actors playing her so it's all kind of a nice through line i think the beginning's a little slow and there's a scene at the end that jake and i were texting about that we were a little confused as to kind of like whether or not that was realistic it kind of pulled us out of the film a little bit but other than that i think it's a very solid effort i, I think that Penn, you know, Penn has been, Penn's what, directed six movies? So, I mean, this is, I think his first movie was, was The Indian Runner. Was that his first movie? Is that the, this is the first not, movie that he's ever directed himself in, I believe. Right, but uh, is the first feature, can someone check that? Is oh, this, sure. I think his first feature film he ever directed, I think it was called The Indian Runner, I believe. Double checking that, so make sure I have that right. Um, but he's made some great films, and I, and I think this is a very solid, solid film from him, and Dylan's performance is great. I do think it's worth seeing. Um, just a couple little nitpick things that I thought were, that could have been fixed a little bit. Indian Runner, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so I, I liked Flag Day a lot. I was, I was actually pleasantly surprised by it. I don't understand why it has such a, I think it has like a 30 something percent of Rotten Tomatoes. I don't really oh. understand why that is. Um, I'm, I guess I'm in the minority in, in liking it as much as I did. I don't know where Jake's at, yeah. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, very much repeat a lot of what Kevin says. Liked it quite a bit, a lot more so than I expected. What, two quick notes. One, we gotta stop doing shots of people grazing their hands over the top of wheat. We've seen it. We've seen it a thousand times. Like no, no more, no more hands grazing over the top of. You're not going to beat Malik. Malik did it, did it the best. And well, see, honestly, I think of Gladiator when I think of it. Gladiator, like, Gladiator. Uh, Gladiator. Yeah. yeah. But um, Malik and, has become that like that guy. Yeah. yeah. That scene and might also, have been edited out yeah. of the TNT version, which is the one that yeah. I usually tend to watch. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, uh, they expanding on that. on Kevin's idea without getting into spoilers, the uh, the movie's big emotional climax, the moment when you're really supposed to just give it your heart. Um, and, and really be in it, for me, was honestly ruined by my knowledge of how television works. And I don't, and I'm really curious to have other people see it, because Kevin and I both talked about this, and because we know how TV works, we, we said there's no way that moment would play out like that. And we're talking mm. the moment the whole movie's leading to yeah. was ruined by knowledge of how TV, but... I it wasn't also ruined, think, it just took me took us out uh, of yeah, it. It's, 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 yeah, it, it's a moment you should not be taken out of. Right, yeah, um, right, right. That being said, I'd be curious if anyone else is listening watches it. Reach out to me. Because I also think the average viewer who doesn't know how TV, who is not in the TV industry, would probably look at that and go, is that how that would work? Oh, like, would that play out that way? Okay. I think people are smart enough to also, I, I just... Like, no one on set told Sean Penn, like, dude, this would not happen this way. Um, and I just, I, so it, <laughs> I, I can't help but, like, feel like the, I, I was robbed of what was supposed to be the big crescendo because of I that. Feel like, I feel like we often have talked about movies where there are scenes where 
someone on the set should have gone up to the director and be like, you know, dude, like <laughs> this it wouldn't play out this it way. It doesn't work hey, that man. way. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like maybe like in the Last Jedi, you think someone came up to Ryan Johnson and was like, "Dude, why are you no, throwing that the saber over your shoulder?" Like, no, you no, no one, no one I said mean, that. No one said that because they were like, "Actually, yeah, Mark Hamill said that." Actually, Mark Hamill did Hamill say that. Did say that. What does he know? Is there a moment? <laughs> what does he know about that character? Right, right, right. What, what would he know? Is there a moment in Flag Day where Sean Penn screams out, "Is that my daughter in there?" And then his daughter comes oh. out and goes, "Yeah." From Mystic River, she's like, <laughs> "Oh, <Yeah>. Kevin." <laughs> what? Quick sidebar. Oh. And there's a moment in Kate where a character goes, "All of them," and it had that has I to be. I thought the same thing, and, and there's, so the, we won't give anything away, but the, this movie, Kate with Mary Elizabeth Winstead, has a very Gary Oldman professional. Yeah. I thought the exact yeah. same thing. And, but, I, and, I, and even the setup is like, like who do you want to get? All of them! Yeah, all yeah. of them. Like It's, yeah. it's very much... Yeah. I would love I thought, to know of, I thought of you thinking of that. Yeah. It was I in remember, Don't I, Breathe too, though, and we asked Fetty about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That that's right. That's right. That's right. I meant to ask Cedric about it today and I forgot. Anyway, I gotta right, go continue. back. I interviewed Gary Oldman for something. It was some movie I forgot all about, but I got to talk to him about that scene from the professional oh, and he cool. gave me this whole story about it. I gotta go back and find that footage. That's but cool. that was a that's one of the greatest lines in the history of cinema. All right. Friday oh. we have a bonus episode with the director uh, Amber Seeley, who has a film coming out in limited release called No Man of God, starring Elijah Wood. Um, and this is a, a really interesting film that I think it gets eclipsed briefly by the fact that it's the same concept as the Netflix television show Mindhunter, um, which is it, hard to top what they accomplished in that over the course of a movie, but um, but is made all the more interesting because um, the fact that the so Elijah Wood plays one of the earliest members of the um, of the agents who are sitting down with serial killers. Uh, in order to um, get to know more about their methods and hopefully use that knowledge that they are picking up to apply to the hunt for other serial killers. Um, but No Man of God is specifically about the agent that, uh, it's based on true story, that sat down with uh, Ted Bundy and, and got to know him and interview him over the course of several years. And uh, this is when Bundy was on uh, death row and was you know sentenced to die, but still had a couple of years before it played out. I thought it was really interesting. I liked it a lot. Um, it, it's it, it does different things than Mindhunter, but it's it's so hard to get out of the the shadow of the fact that um, that we saw this similar concept play out. I thought Elijah Wood was really good in it. I'm blanking on the name of the guy who plays Bundy, but he's totally charismatic. You're gonna we talked to Amber Staley about the casting of him as well too. Uh, she really did her research. You'll hear in our bonus episode on Friday. She knows a ton about Bundy. She knows a ton about uh, the investigations into his alleged crimes, and uh, and also and, past representations. Like she was very knowledgeable yeah. of of different ways he's been portrayed within pop culture. Yes. So um, it's in limited release. I think it's worth checking out. Uh, it's a great performance by Elijah Wood. Again, I really like the guy who played Ted Bundy. Amber Staley did a really great job directing it. Uh, I would recommend you guys check it out in limited release and definitely listen to our interview with her on Friday. Uh, I want to get to Candyman because I think you guys are coming at this from two totally different perspectives. And I want to give you time to, to uh, open up about it. Jakey, start with you because you're a horror aficionado around here, and um, tell us what you thought about. And Jake, and Jake you said top ten of the year for you for this. I mean, right, right now, yes. Um, okay, okay. I, I very much loved this movie. I loved what it says about Chicago. I love what it says about the legends that that we all hear growing up. You know, Candyman introduces the, this new one, the the, the 2021 version introduces a really interesting idea, which is that we all have a Candyman growing up, which I think is, is, is true. We all have, growing up in the town that we live in, that story about that guy or that thing that happened in that scary house that's kind of, that's born from this trauma. I, I grew up in, you know, in, in Seabrook, Texas, and there was the Moody Mansion. There was the guy in the Moody Mansion that did this and did that. And it was, you know, in that, so in theory, oh. that would be, you know, every, every the, that would be my Candyman. Everyone, everyone I, has. I've got you beat. You know, Massapequa uh, Park, where I grew up on Long Island, is the yeah. town next door to Amityville. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, that, that's, yeah. So, so yeah, everyone has kind of their own. Mine was, mine was Candyman growing yeah. up, weirdly enough. Yeah. So, what's, so what's interesting is that, you know, for people that, that have maybe haven't seen the original 99.2 version in a while, it's based on uh, an area of Chicago that really doesn't exist in that way anymore called Cabrini Green. 
and it was sort of a very rough part of town. Um, the main reason I know about it is hearing incredible stories from a cameraman that worked at my station at the time. They would have to go there and shoot stories, and usually they were negative stories because it was kind of a, a, a crime-heavy uh, area. And so from there is where the legend, some, 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 the violence and the trauma um, that was inflicted in that area is, in theory, in the, in the movie, where the legend of Candyman uh, is born from. And so what I think this movie explores, which is really interesting, which to me adds a different layer than most monster slasher movies have, is that that area of Chicago is very gentrified now. Like they, they tore down Cabrini Green, the, the, the high rise projects are no longer there. It's a Whole Foods, it's a Target, it's, a, it's, it's you know, it's, um, it's, it's just not that. So sure. it presents this idea of if these monsters and these legends and these myths are born from from this type this world what happens to them when it's not that world? what happens 30 years later okay when those areas are bull or bulldozed down what ha what happens when those areas are gentrified like if there's so, a pop-up neighborhood uh where camp crystal lake used to be yeah exactly like yeah exactly it, it, then, then like yeah. what what happened to jason and and and, okay. and i and so it really it, so when you add add that which i think is a really interesting commentary on 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 because it, it, yes that happened in chicago but that could happen in any major metropolis in the, in the in the u.s um and then you add the whole idea of we all have our own candy man um it doesn't just have to be one guy um i think there are just a lot of really interesting ideas explored i thought it was beautifully directed i've seen a million movies that have been shot in chicago and how different the same buildings have been framed the same way i thought um, you know, this is framed in a very unique way to the point where I want to ruin stuff. But like, I thought my screener was messed up at the beginning because some of the interesting things they do, I was like, oh God, did they, did they send me a, like a messed up screener? Um, and, uh, and, and I really, I loved a lot and I liked the, and I know Kevin and I are going to sort of touch base on this. Um, I liked sort of the slow burn of it. I know I, I, I didn't mind sort of the slower pace off the top because honestly it reminded me of the 92 version in which Tony Todd doesn't show up to almost an hour in to Candyman. Um, I liked that it established these ideas uh, before really laying out into the, oh yeah, by the way, we're a slasher movie monster too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just thought it was a really cool idea. You know, it also, you know, you've got these really deep ideas and then you've also got the like, you know, 10 year old kid inside of me that's scared to go in a bathroom, turn off the lights and say Candyman five times into a mirror. So, the, so you know, I felt like it was able to sort of um, benefit both both horror sides of me, the one that wants deeper elements and also the one that just wants the, hair, the hell scared out of me. Um, and then I thought- that Is the it crescendo scary? That, I, I, here's the deal. I, I really wish I could have seen it in a theater. I, I saw it for the junket and was given a screener. They weren't able to set up a screening for me because it was yeah. so last minute. So I tried to make the most out of the experience. I waited until the sunset because you guys have been in my apartment. It's very, very naturally lit apartment. So I waited until it was very dark, um, turned off all the lights. I tried to make it as much of a cinematic experience as I could. Can't say I was ever actually scared, but I was into the scary moments. I was like, okay, okay. I'm sold. And a lot, and some of so them, no. particularly one in a bathroom, uh, <laughs> was shot very well. Uh, it's, it's in the same way that like I wouldn't judge a comedy watching it at home the same way I would necessarily watch it in, in, on a Friday night in a packed theater. Like you have to take in, into account how different experiences can can subject you to different okay. sort of you know. Um, so and and I thought the final act of the film, without getting into spoilers, was just oh, just a crescendo of of everything I wanted out of the movie. Again, really brought all these ideas I thought were super interesting together into one sort of Venn diagram, and then also tapped off with, oh, by the way, we're a fucking monster slasher movie, okay. and then went out with a bang. So I, I am wholly, wholly, wholly into this movie. Kev? Uh, I didn't find it scary at all. Um, the 1992 film is horrifying, like one of the scariest horror films I've ever seen. I, I, I still genuinely get freaked out um, just by some of the imagery that I saw in terms of Tony Todd in the in the first in the 1992 film, there's not a single scene in this movie that I found memorable from a from a horror standpoint. Um, so a couple things. I have no problem with a slow burn in terms of horror. I actually love a slow burn when the actual slow burning elements are interesting. Um, I think Yahya Abdul Mateen the second is a great actor. Loved him in Watchmen. I thought he was great in Aquaman. I thought he was great in Trial of the Chicago 7. Um, his performance here is fine. I, to me, what I found interesting about this film was the, was, the, was the visual storytelling. To me, the visual storytelling is much more interesting than the thematic storytelling. Like, all the messages, everything that Jake's talking about is all in there. Everything about what he's saying is all in there. 
Um, I just don't know that it was interestingly told to a point where it thematically affected me as a viewer. I understood what they were going for. I understood everything they were saying uh, in terms of, and I say they in terms of just filmmakers in general. Um, but I just didn't, I, I, I did not latch on to really anything emotionally in the story. I, th I thought that Coleman Domingo gave a great performance, but he was sparingly kind of throughout the film. And he, when he showed up to me, the, the, really, the film got really interesting. Every time he was on screen, he commanded a very interesting presence. Um, cinematography wise, the way this film is shot is is astounding. Um, there's an elevator sequence, which is in the trailer that they shot with a two way mirror in order to get the reflections to uh, get out of the shot um, with Yaya, which is which, which is that is absolutely outstanding. Is it scary? No, but I found it to be interestingly shot like the upside down shots of the city. Um, there's so many different things about it that I found interesting from a visual standpoint. I just didn't find the story or the way they built it up to the ending that Jake is referring to, to be interesting. Therefore make it made the ending a lot less more impactful, a uh, lot less impactful uh, for me as a viewer. Um, it's an interesting film because I, I, is, is it a bad movie? Not really. Um, but it's, it's kind of in that gray area where I thought it was fine. Um, I, I texted you guys. I said, candy men. Like, it, it was, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was visually stunning. I genuinely believe that a better director, and I'm not saying Nia is a bad, is it Nia or Naya? I want to clarify that. Uh, DaCosta is her name. I think it's correct? Nia. Okay, I believe it's, it's Nia DaCosta. Da yeah. I'm very interested in what she's going to be doing, and I think from a visual standpoint, her direction is, the, the actual visuals of this film are what makes the movie work. I didn't find the storytelling to be that interesting. So for me, I'm kind of lukewarm on the film. I, 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 I'm interested to see where the where the audience uh, or the reviews come in. I don't think any of the reviews are out yet. I'm not even sure when the embargo lifts. So I don't even know when this is going to be dropping. But I'm just curious to see kind of where other critics stand. Because mm. I respect and reg uh, and understand everything that where Jake is coming from. Um, obviously, the, Ch the Chicago thing is very important to you. And I think that's a very important aspect of the way you viewed the film as well. Um, and I think for me, I don't know, I, 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 saw, I saw it at night, turned the lights off in the house, turned my sound all the way up. I also had a screener because of the junket. Uh, there was not a screening set for the junket for me, um, so I did not have the option to go into the theater. Uh, but I, yeah, I thought, it was a, I thought it was a fine, fine film. I didn't think it was anything special and it, and it, and it didn't scare me at all. And I don't know if that's in the sense of where we are as, an, uh, as a culture now in terms of the, the way we view violence. Um, but we are so inundated with so much brutal brutality in, in, in everything we watch that some of that stuff is just not shocking anymore, to be honest with you. Um, there's some really cool visual that they do. That's I think I think they released this mm -hmm. uh, or part the, the of puppets. this. The puppets. Mm. That stuff is really cool. Looking. Like shadow puppets. Yeah. Is that what they are? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But I mean, it was um, it, it, the movie. The movie didn't. The movie's fine. It just didn't work for me overall. Okay. I thought it, I thought it had some very interesting visual storytelling, but thematically and storytelling wise, I wasn't latched onto it. Okay. Uh, one one other thing I want to add is because because Kevin mentioned sort of the imagery, and I will say the imagery in the in, in the original film and this one are a little different because I think they're they're made through two prisms. The original film um, was based on uh, a, a story by Clive Barker, who's the guy that did Hellraiser, mm -hmm. a one much more best. brutal brutal yeah. um, like horror bees guy. Bees coming out of their yeah. mouth. And so yeah, I, yeah, yeah, so I think horrifying. that yeah. that film is made through the the Clive Barker prism. I would argue because he's a producer and a co-writer on this film. This film seems to be made through more of the Jordan Peele prism. Okay. Um, so I would say both of them are kind of like different reflections of different types of, of horror filmmakers. Yeah. And one of, one of the points I always love to drive home when it comes to horror stuff is whether or not a film is scary, in my eyes, has no impact on whether or not it, it's a great film. Like, I, I, I mean, sure. there, there are lots of films that I, that I find scarier than Candyman that I don't like as much as Candyman. You know, because yeah. it's, you know, it, whenever someone says like, oh, it's not scary, therefore it's not a horror film. Like, no, it's not Quite, not that you no, were saying that. Not that you were saying that. But just like I, people say, say that to me all the time, and I go like, "Well, that's not quite how it works." Mm. Like, like Midsommar is not scary, but Midsommar is a is a horror film. Like Midsommar it's, it's, is an unsettling film. It's like it, like mm. it's an interesting thing because Candyman. I, I think the 1992 film sets a precedent for what you expect a Candyman film to be. And again, I'm not saying that every Candyman film following has to be like that. But there, uh, like when I walked away from the 1992 Candyman, it's it stayed with me for years. Like that, that movie is regardless of horror, just the, the, just what that film did from a visual standpoint has put things in my mind that I never want, that I always, that I just want to forget. 
You know what I mean? And this mm-hmm. film, I just didn't feel like it, it gave me it. anything new. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't bad. It's just not great for me. Sean, okay. are you going to try to see it? Are you going to try to make a point to... Yeah, but I, I kind of realized through all this run-up that I've never seen the original. And I don't know oh, why. Oh, 92 and is great. Yeah, if you yes. get a chance, I would... And all, you know, and... and there, if you don't, there are there are some plot points you need to remember from the original, but they kind of recap them with the shadow puppets. But it okay, would just be yeah. made all the. It would, I think, Kevin. I'm curious of your thoughts, and I said this on the air. It's just better if you remember it from the movie, as opposed were to there, here's this thing that here's the cliff notes. Were there a bunch of other Candyman movies, or just one? There are other sequels. Yes, there's yeah, but other they sequels. Weren't like, yeah. They weren't like major films. Were no, they, they were not. Like in fact, I think some of them may have even straight to straight to well, straight to VHS. That's about right. Time, VHS. Yeah. yeah. Even, even Tony Todd yeah. himself yeah. told me that, like, yeah, we kind of lost what we were meant to be going for. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and, and, before, and I, I do want to say I respect everything Jake said because I, I understand where he's coming from. He's very passionate about horror and movie monsters. Yeah, but that doesn't make my opinion I carry just, more weight than anyone else. No, I know. I, I but I, 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 I never like like we have a situation where like, you love something so much, and I'm just kind of like in that lukewarm element. But I, I, it's an interesting film. I'm very curious to see what what Sean thinks and other people think. I'll try and check it out for sure. Um, before we get to the blend game, uh, there's breaking news that uh, um, I'm trying to get confirmed through the studio, but Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage, is reportedly going to get delayed until 2022. Oh, oh God. So there will not be carnage. There, there may be carnage, but later. Yes, <laughs> Let There Be Carnage next year. Uh, it's apparently going to take... Do they show any thing? Venom stuff? Uh, I'm sorry, wait, say that again. Jake is, first. Is it a COVID delay? Sorry, oh, go ahead, Jake. Uh, it's just saying multiple sources are saying that Venom is going to be delayed until January 21st. Um, although Sony Oof. is waiting until after the annual CinemaCon exhibition to make a proper announcement. According to Variety, several sources have revealed that the much delayed, highly anticipated Venom sequel will leave 2021 entirely, even as studios wrestle with putting movies exclusively in theaters. Venom's 2022 January release date is currently occupied by the Jared Leto movie Morbius, which will likely shift dates once Venom moves into its spot. And when is, I, I, you know, I feel like they're discounting how big of a hit Scream is going to be. When isn't Scream January? There's a second part to this. Sorry, Jake, that I don't know if you got to see. This is all happening in the moment. But they also mentioned this report from Vulture is a bunch of sort of anonymous inside sources. Um, there's another paragraph where they say, that the short-term outlook is that Autumn's big films such as Dune and Top Gun will most likely stay on their scheduled release dates, although Marvel Studios' Eternals could be delayed if Shang-Chi underperforms at the box office, oh, according my. to their sources. Whoa. That's wow. going to go again. This is uh, but, but again, this is according to uh, an anonymous source on one, on one side. As Sean mentioned, he's trying to get that confirmed, but yeah. a crazy write-up that happened in the middle of this show, for sure. Hey, look, we finally got to report on news as it's happening instead hey, of finding out after that. we've logged off. Now, because of this, five minutes after the show, breaking news, movies stop being made forever. <laughs> <laughs> show's canceled. All right, blend game. Uh, we are playing hashtag Coleman Domingo blend uh, in honor of his uh, performance in Candyman. Kevin saying that when he was on screen, it was one of the better parts of the film. Uh, however, I'll go first, and I really can't choose anything but Zola. And I'm sorry Same. if it's just yeah, Same. really. I mean, he's. And but there's I, a moment in Zola where it, that that the question is answered for me. Well, go yeah. ahead. I know it's uh, I probably touch on that also, but go ahead. Tell t- no, tell us go, about the go, moment. You... In, so I mean, he's been in some incredible films, and he's worked with some incredible filmmakers: uh, Spike Lee, Ava Duver- Ava DuVernay, in Selma. And I almost picked Selma because Selma is that you know groundbreaking of a film, like just a truly remarkable capture of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And but, but again, I think that that performance is so totally um, about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And so it's tough to pick yeah. uh, Coleman Domingo for this. But his presence and the shadow that he casts over Zola is uh, it's the driving narrative forward. It's like he's the one who takes these girls on this adventure. He's the one who essentially keeps one against her will, you know, uh, uh, in this place where she doesn't want to be. Uh, and Kevin's going to Kevin's bringing up the the moment where I 
actually like sat up straight in my chair and I was like, oh my God, what is going on with this guy? And it's an accent change. Like he's had an accent for the longest time. Um, yeah. And then it, it drops, it disappears. And you begin to realize that, and, and it gets very angry and very menacing. And it's almost like what I would call a parent voice. Like your, your parent voice changes when you want your kids to, hey, I'm not, this isn't bullshit. Like, listen up now, I'm actually trying to say something to you. Um, and he uses his parent voice and it made me stand up and the hair on the back of my uh, arms stood up and I was like, oh my God, this means business. But it also meant that, oh wait, they're in the presence of someone who is malicious and can really uh, turn this situation south in a heartbeat. And Coleman Domingo sells that in a way that I was not expecting. Um, I don't watch Fear the Walking Dead, but I, I think he's a significant part of that show too. Um, so I wish I knew a little bit more about his performance there. And I know that Zola is fresh you know, in my mind right now, uh, being one of the most recent performances of his because I haven't seen Candyman yet. But it, for this game, I couldn't not pick it. So um, that's that's where I went. I don't know about you, Kevin, because really you said it perfectly, so I'm not going to say much more than that. But But I actually went to IMDb to try to find something other than Zola. Yeah. Like, because Zola was the first one that came to my mind, and like, went, and granted, great, really great filmography. He's worked with some truly incredible directors. Uh, but every title I went, and I thought the same thing. Like, Fear of the Walking Dead. I was like, I wish I knew more about. I gave up on Walking Dead years ago. Sure. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I tried to find something. I was like, surely there's something that that wasn't so recent. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't, you can't top that. I'll tell you right now, Sean put it perfectly. The, it, it, like your parents yelling at you and, and, and you know you're in trouble standing standing up at attention I don't remember the last time a scene like that in a movie happened where I just mm -hmm. I, I almost like audibly gasped like yeah. what the hell just happened like where did this guy come from yep. like it's honestly one of the most incredible transitions you'd almost I, would you almost compare it like a Jekyll and Hyde almost yes. almost thing yeah. because yeah. uh because I'm sorry. Did you already yeah. reference it like that? I couldn't no. remember if you did. No, no but it's scarier no, like, because he's in control. That that almost right. makes it scarier. Well, it's it's interesting because like the guy the guy that we we meet already isn't the greatest person on the planet. Like he sure. yeah he's what what he's doing isn't you know isn't the greatest thing on the planet. So he's already a bit of a seedy character in in, in that sense. I mean, the whole movie is presented in a very in, it's 16 millimeter. It's very dirty is the, kind of the word I would use in terms of the way they put you into this world. I mean, especially that montage scene, which I would argue is one of the most insane things I've ever seen in a movie. But the moment where Coleman changes accents and that, that that's it. That mm -hmm. That's the only answer I could give for this game. Like that yeah. is one of the most, I think he deserves to win an Oscar for that, for that You've moment. You've been saying that, Al yeah. Al alone, yes. that dude deserves an Academy Award. That scene should be played at the Oscars. Imagine if he like, got an Oscar nomination, but that wasn't his clip. Oh, <laughs> I would quit. Yeah. I do wonder though, <laughs> would that clip be as effective Oh, no. In a short clip. Oh, that's a good you, point. Because you would need the buildup yeah, of like of who he's been. Because sure. by the time by the time we that moment happens, we're used to him in a way of the way he speaks. Yes. And I think he does the change. Does he do it twice in the film or three times? I can't remember how many times he does it. He switches a couple times. I remember um, it the one time for sure. He might. I think it might be twice. I think it, does it again later, yeah. or I think he actually does full scene later on in that. In that, I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I've might seen be in the that. hotel room later. There's this confrontation in the hotel hotel room later. And, and but he's it shows that you version. that it shows yeah. you the character we've been watching that whole time is a mask that he's wearing. Like you 100%. think that it's him, you yes. think that that's his character, but then he removes the mask and shows you who he actually is. Yeah, and it's super unnerving. I'm trying uh, to remember. Is there anything close to that that you could think of? in a character shift that comes to mind right away because something that I, I'm trying to remember the last time my jaw dropped because of something like that. Like, I mean, I mean, my different, jaw drops. different circumstances, but in the same idea of Holy crap, that's impressive would be McAvoy and split. Sure. Uh, yeah. McAvoy and split. You know what I mean? Just, I mean, but yeah. you know what I mean? But like, I, it's a, I don't mean to compare but the two, but just in terms of like, Holy crap. Yeah. It's, able, it's really impressive. You're able to go from one to the other. So the only one so I, quickly. Can, I go back to is, uh, is, um, Usual Suspects. You mean, honestly, uh, the reveal yeah. of the oh, Individual that's Suspects. A, yeah. Great one. And that yeah. one's more of a slower build. Sure. Because we kind of like pan up from his foot, right? It doesn't just start on the foot. Yeah. Um, right? It starts on the foot, right? And he's dragging uh -huh. it, and then mm -hmm. it kind of like starts walking. And he um, straightens out, yeah. Right. That's that's a good one. This one was so shocking 
But like the way you put it, it was so perfect. It's like a parent literally yelling at you. I've used that voice. I've had for to. For your attention. Yeah, Multiple like, times. It, yeah. On and YouTube. it's scary. But it's scary. <laughs> Don, did you change accents? <laughs> yes. That scene in Zola, scarier than anything in Candyman. Well. Wow. <laughs> I, will, I will say that. I mean, I, that scene in Zola was one of the most fright. That's probably one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. I, I have... I'm telling you right now, I wish there was a video of my face when that scene happened. <laughs> like, I really wish there was a camera rolling on my face when that, I, I, don't, I think I, I think I, I, I rewound it. I, for sure, I rewound that moment. I couldn't believe, I, I honestly couldn't believe what I was hearing. Like, what just happened? He was wow. also really good in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, by the way. Oh, that's great. A, a, yes. a, a, a really, really underrated performance of his. And, and I think, I, I know that a lot of the attention was on Viola and Chadwick, but... Mm. His performance in that movie, the way that he kind of navigates that room, um, he's a really underrated actor. Also, Bill really Street. Hope... I feel oh, like, oh my god, yeah, yeah. I feel like he's gonna be a, an actor we talk about for yeah. the next few years. But he's still underrated, which is interesting to me. And I think mm. he's having a moment right now mm-hmm. within our world of like sure. movies, like, uh, but like, like my mom doesn't know who Coleman Domingo is, right? Sure. But like, he's having a big moment in in terms of the movies we're watching, like the, Z- like the Zolas and the My, My Rainy Black Bottom, like they're, they're they're not like major, I mean, they're major films, Candy they're not Man. like yeah. blockbusters, but yep. Candyman, Candy, he's great in Candyman, like mm-hmm. genuinely, Jake, I mean, I thought, I thought yeah. he was the best part of Candyman. Yeah. Like, is his, he Candyman? Is he Candyman? I won't. No, we're not gonna say anything. But his character. No, well, if you watch the trailer, he actually has a great. I think one of the best lines in the movie. I think it's in the movie, and it's also in the trailer, which is like, "What's the line, Jake? It's like uh, he Candyman's not a he. He's the whole damn hive. He's the whole damn hive. Right. And like the way Coleman delivers that. Like Coleman is like Coleman's super cold and creepy it's in this movie. Brutal. He's like, yeah, that is the best line delivery. <laughs> they're not human. They're brutal. They're brutal. That's All right, next week, uh, <laughs> reach out on Twitter <laughs> using hashtag uh, Michelle Yo Blend. We're going to be. Oh, wow. Yes, a fun one. A oh, very I fun love one. her. Um, one of my favorite compliments I've ever gotten in, in, in my career doing interviews um, was I interviewed, I've only interviewed her one time. She's a freaking legend. Um, and when the interview was over, she ended the interview by saying, thank you for actually asking smart questions. Oh, nice. And I thought that was, it was for last Christmas. Hmm. I got her for gunpowder milkshake, and she did not tell me that. Unfortunately, some things don't need to be said. <laughs> well, She's not Sean, one to your the question obvious. was, "What's your favorite flavor of milkshake?" Favorite? It kind of <laughs> <laughs> Is it gunpowder? <laughs> <laughs> you think she got asked that a lot that day? <laughs> uh, all right. So hashtag Michelle Yoblend, and uh, you can also email us at realblend at sevenblend That is where uh, this week's review comes from, and it was from Rachel Ho, who's been uh, listening to the show for a while. And has been interacting with us on social media as well, too. And she writes to us and says, Dearest Real Blend Boys, longtime listener, first time caller. I want to extend a giant thank you to all four of you. Back in 2019, I was a bit lost career-wise. I was in a profession I had been working towards since high school. And when I got there, it was just cheese pizza. I have always loved movies and writing and never really thought that I could or would parlay this love into an actual career. Enter Real Blend. Through your podcast, specifically some advice that you gave me in a or gave in a premium episode, the four of you inspired me to start a blog and reach out to outlets to write for them. It's been a steady process, and I'm happy to say that over the last year, I've been able to write reviews and interview directors, and I'm even going to hey. be covering she's even going to be covering TIFF this year. Hey! Oh, she's covering TIFF and none of us are. I'm, say, I'm not going to TIFF. <laughs> like, like, we're not covering TIFF and you no. are. Look, so look, look, you, I don't want to be inspiring the to the point where you're getting shit that I'm not getting, okay? Like, so let's scale back the inspiration a little bit. Uh, like, 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 be good, but don't be that good. I yeah, have no on. idea. <laughs> I heard Michelle Yeoh told her that she uh, had really smart <laughs> questions. That's way better questions than the last guy. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea where this will take me, but regardless of how successful or not I become, thank you all for not just providing me with engaging and entertaining discussions about movies on a weekly basis, but for inspiring me to actually get up off my butt and take a shot at something I thought was well out of my reach. Dunkirk forever, Rachel. Hey. That's an amazing That's awesome. Thing. That's so, so she cool. Referenced Two things, cheese pizza and Dunkirk. That makes me. Yeah, I'm gonna say she's a longtime listener. That, we haven't, that, uh, going... we haven't, we haven't Dunkirked it in a while. No, but I actually get a lot of emails. I get a good amount of emails from people who, and they end it with Hubie, which is 
That makes me so happy. That's (laughs) that's actually awesome. That's amazing. Uh, Our next premium episode, which you can get if you go to uh, cinemablend.com backslash realblendpremium. Cinemablend.com backslash realblendpremium. Uh, It's a mailbag episode. And... I missed it, but the boys held down held down the fort with some interesting. Yeah. So uh, this week's questions. premium episode will only cost you three seventy five because Sean's not part of it. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Um, what, what was I just gonna say? Shoot, I totally blanked. Uh, it was a mailbag, and I wasn't part of it, and I was letting people know. No. Fall, uh, uh, what? I'm sorry, I threw you off. I'm sorry. Uh, you totally <laughs> threw me off. Um, I'm sorry. What are they going to plug the... Uh, oh, the, the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Again, um, we have the listening yes. party on Monday, the 30th, at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you're following along. We'll put oh, it on. I have socials. to wear my fedora. Well, it's not like a live thing, though. I mean, when you have, can. When have you ever heard that sentence before? <laughs> and let Jake me get my whip. To, yeah, well, uh, uh, Jake, Jake uses that all the time also. Uh, on social media, at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean Y'all just jealous because I can pull it off. At Gabe Kova. Oh, you actually, actually, I thought you were kidding, but you have a badass Indiana Jones costume. I think you went as Indiana Jones last Halloween, and it's it's really good. Yeah, there it is. Look at that! That's fantastic! That looks really good. Uh, That's not a guy that goes to to Club Obi-Wan. Real blend. (sighs) He should, though. uh, Okay, we're back next week. We have, um, we'll do Shang-Chi, and we'll have some new guests, and we'll have lots of new topics. And I'll talk about more about CinemaCon, because we ran out of time this week. Um, so I'll tell you guys more about what I saw and give you a social media reaction to Ghostbusters. So until next week, Minority Hubie! Report. Catch him if you can. No, dude, dude oh, Spielberg, like man. Spielberg, man. Yeah, Hubie. Spielberg. We're trying to get Spielberg. Oh, You're going to get us the Hubie director by accident. Yeah. I want I want Hubie. I want the Hubie director on the show. <laughs>